Maniac McGee, Set 10, Chapters 38 through 41. The witnesses, they were twice 15 this time, went with him as far as Hector Street. They halted at the curb. He crossed the street and went on alone. Hyper megaphoned after him. Maniac, come back. We was just kidding. You don't have to. Maniac just waved and went on. He knew he should be feeling afraid of these East Enders, these so-called black people. But he wasn't. It was himself he was afraid of, afraid of any trouble that he might cause just by being there. It was the day of the worms, that first almost warm after the rainy night day in April when you bolt from your house to find yourself in a world of worms. They were as numerous here in the East End as they had been in the West. The sidewalks, the streets, the very, the very places where they didn't belong for long marooned on concrete and asphalt no place to burrow april's orphans once when he was little in holidaysburg he had gone along with his toy wheelbarrow carefully lifting them with a with a borrow, borrowed kitchen fork until the barrow was full and then dumped them into mr snavely's compost pile and sure as the worms followed the rain the kids followed the worms west end east end they had poured from their houses onto the cool damp sidewalks and if they gave the worms any notice, it was only when they squashed one underfoot. And so as Maniac moved through the East End, he felt the presence of not one, but two populations, both occupying the same territory, yet each unmindful of the other, one yelping and playing and chasing and laughing, the other lost and silent and dying by the millions. Yo, fish belly, Maniac snapped to. He glanced at a street sign. He was four blocks from Hector, deep in the east. Mars Bar came dip, jiving toward him, taller than before, bigger, but still scowling. Hey, fish, thought you was gone. Maniac turned to face him fully. Mars Bar did not stop till he was inside Maniac's phone booth of space, inches from his face. They locked eyes, levelly. Maniac thinking, I must be growing too, he said. I'm back. The scowl fiercened. Maybe nobody told you. I'm badder than ever. I'm getting badder every day. I'm almost afraid to wake up in the morning. He leaned in closer. Cause of how bad I might have got overnight. Minax smiled, nodded. Yeah, you're bad, Mars. He gave a sniff. His smile went a little smirky. And I'm getting so bad myself, I think I must be half black. Mars's eyes bulged, he backed off, the scowl collapsed, and he howled with laughter. His buddies, who were hanging back, stared dumbly. As Mars unwound with his laughing fit, he studied Maniac up and down, aware, too, that Maniac was studying him. When he could speak again, he said, Still, them raggedy clothes, huh, fish? He lifted one foot, posed. I seen you looking, like my, like them kicks, just got them. Maniac nodded. Nice. They were more than nice. They were beautiful. The best. Yes, the baddest. Sneaks he had ever seen. Way better than anything Grayson could have afforded. I forgot to tell you something else, too, fish. What's that? I'm fast. I mean, I'm faster. I've been working out. Got my new boss kicks. He sprinted in place, arms and legs pissing into a blur. He stopped. He, he jabbed a finger at Maniac's nose, pressed it, flattening the soft end of it. See? Guess you were right. Now at least you got a black nose. He laughed. They both laughed. Everybody laughed. Then Mars turned to Scowly again, saying, But you ain't black enough or bad enough to beat the Mars man. We're gonna race, honky donkey. The race was set up on Plum Street, the long level block between Ash and Jackson. By the time they were ready, half of the kids in the East End were there. From the tiniest pick squeaks to high schoolers, the little kids ran races of their own from curb to curb. The bigger kids shouldered blasters and dug into their jeans for coins to bet with. For the first time since last fall, mothers opened windows and leaned out, out from second stories. Traffic was detoured from both ends of the block. No one can find string for the finish, so a second-story mother dropped down a spool of bright pink thread. Another problem was the start. 
First, they had to find chalk to draw the starting line. When they did, nobody could seem to draw it straight. The result, a stack of starting lines creeping up the street till someone brought out a yardstick and did it right. The next problem came when the starter, Bump Gilliam, who was also Bar Mars Bars' best pal, called, Get ready! And someone in the crowd yelled, That ain't what you say! You say, Take your mark! Well, everybody jumped into it then. There was shoving and jawing and almost a fist fight over the proper way to start a race. Finally, there was a compromise, a bump called, Get ready on your mark! At which point, someone else called, Go Mars! And Bump turned and snarled, Shut up! When the starter starts, there's no noise. So naturally, someone else called, Smoke Mars! And then came, Waves to Mars! And do the whole bar, man! And they might still be calling to this day, had not a single voice separated itself from the others. Barnum McGee goes hands down, laughing and pointing from his perch on the roof of a car. Bump jumped into the let up. Get set, go! And at la long last, mossy from their weight at the starting line, they went. Even as the race began, even after it began, Maniac wasn't sure how to run it. Naturally, he wanted to win, or at least to do his best. All his instincts told him that, but there were other considerations whom he was racing against and where and what the consequences might be if he won, these were heavy considerations, heavy enough to slow him down. Until the hysterical crowd and the sight of Mars Bars' sneaker bottoms and the boiling of his own blood ignited his afterburners, and before you could say, Burner McGee, he was ahead, the pink thread bobbing in his sights, but he never saw his, his body break the thread. He saw only the face of Mars Bars straining, gasping, unbelieving losing they went crazy they went wild they went totally bananas you see him he turned round he ran backwards he did it backwards he beat him going backwards mars mars tried he shoved bump you started too fast i wasn't ready he shoved the thread holders you moved it up so he could win i was gaining on him he shoved maniac you bumped me. You got a false start. You cheated. But his protest drowned in the pandemonium. Why did I do it? Was all Maniac could think. He hadn't even realized it till he crossed the line, and he regretted it instantly. Wasn't it enough just to win? Did he have to disgrace his opponent as well? Had he done it deliberately to pay back Mars Bars for all his nastiness? To show him up and shut him up once and for all? His only recolle recollection was a feeling of sheer joyful exuberance himself in celebration, shouting, Amen, in the Bethany Church, bashing John McNabb's fastballs out of the sight, dancing the polka with Grayson. Maybe it was that simple, after all. Who asked why otters toboggan down mud banks? That didn't make it any less stupid or rotten a thing to do. The hatred in Mars Barge's eyes was no longer for a white kid in the East End. It was for Jeffrey McGee, period. The crowd surged with him as he made his way westward. It wasn't clear whether they were glad or not that he had won, only that they had seen something to set them off. They jostled and jammed and high-fived and jived for everyone who called him White Lightning. Two more challenged him to a race. Right here, baby, you and me. See who's going to turn his back on who? Maniac kept moving, embarrassed, wishing he could just break out and sprint for the West End, wishing he could duck into the Beals' house and be sanctuary there and not fear reprisals on them. But just about then, miraculously, two little hands were warming into his two familiar voices squealing, Maniac! Maniac! Hester and Lester! He snatched them up, one in each arm. He was on Sycamore Street. There was the house, the door opening. Amanda, Mrs. Beale, smiling to beat the band. During the night, March doubled back and grabbed April by the scruff of the neck and flung it another week or two down the road. When Maniac slipped slightly from the house at dawn, the only way he'd ever managed to get away, March pounced with cold and nasty paws. But Maniac wasn't minding. The reunion had been ecstatic and tearful and nonstop happy, and inside he was pure July. 
He was half a block on, up Sycamore before he stopped tiptoeing. Minutes later, he crossed Hector. The streets were dry. On occasion, scrap of chewed rawhide was all that remained of the worms. Hours later, Russell and Piper spotted him three blocks off. Maniac, you're alive? We thought they got you. We thought they slit your throat. We thought they strangled you and pulled your tongue out. We thought they chopped your head off and, and, and boiled you. Yeah, boiled you. And drunk your blood. Yeah, and drunk your brains. You don't drink brains, you moron meatball. Yeah, you do. Brains are like milkshakes, like, like Dairy Queen. You can drink them with a straw. You can hear them sloshing if you shake your head hard enough. Listen. Hey, get off my head. Hey, help. They were off and running. Maniac couldn't help laughing. In spite of their twisted, ludicrous impressions of the Eastenders, the concern and the tears in their eyes had been genuine. They had really missed him. They had really been afraid for him. Two houses away, you could hear the thump, almost feel it. And Father George McNabb's voice, Lay him down easy, I said. Easy, followed by son John. This easy enough? Thump, followed by a string of curses from George McNabb that fried the cold morning like an egg. The living room was hazy with dust. At the back end of the dining room, they were bringing in the cinder blocks. George and John and a handful of cobras lugging and grunting them in from the backyard and dumping them onto the floor. Thump, thump. Hey, kid, George McNabb was pointing through the haze. Three months, and he still didn't know his tenant's name? Get your lily hide over here. Start lugging these. Maniac waved. Later, gotta go. He shut the door and headed up the street. So they were really doing it. He had heard them planning it for weeks, making drawings, buying or stealing cement, trowels, a level, a pillbox, they called it. Once it was done, they'd be ready. Let the revolts begin. Let the rebels, as they called the Eastenders, come. Let them bust through the newly installed bars over the plywood on the windows. Let them bust through the steel door. They'll find themselves staring down the barrel of a little surprise. They squabbled over the su over what the surprise should be. Uzi? AK-47? Bazooka? Why? Maniac had asked Giant John one day. Why what? Why are you doing all this? To get ready, what else? What do you think's going to happen? What's going to, going to happen? Giant John swatted a squad of roaches from the kitchen table and sat down. What's going to happen is one of these days they're going to revolt. Who says? Who cares who says? You think you're going to make an announcement? Maniac tried to picture Amanda and Esther and Lester and Bow Wow storming the barricades. When's all this supposed to happen? John shrugged. You never know. Maybe the summer. He jumped up, gra grabbed a beer from the fridge, flipped it open. They like to revolt in the summer. It makes them itchy. They like to overrun the cities. This time we'll be ready. And he told Maniac what he often imagined lying in bed. The black sweeping across Hector, one streaming summer night. Torches, chains, blades, guns, war cries, marauding, looting, overrunning the West End. Climbing in through smashed windows, doors, looking for whites, bloodthirsty for whites, like Indians in the old days. Indians on a raid. That's what they are, Giant John nodded thoughtfully. Today's Indians. The cockroach strolling up his pant leg wasn't the only thing made, making Maniac feel crawly. He took off the roach. He moved to the center of the kitchen to surround himself with as much space as possible. But other people, he said, I don't hear them talking about revolts. Nobody else wants to make a pillbox. Giant John tilted the last of the beer into his mouth. Maybe when we do, he grinned, they will. That had been weeks before, and now the pillbox was underway. No longer an idea in the backyard, but a reality in the dining room. Now there was no room that Maniac could stand in the middle of and, and feel clean. Now there was something else in that house, that, and it smelled worse than garbage and turds. He ran far that day, away from the town, letting the wind wash him. 
When he returned to the West End, he heard in the distance Mrs. Pickwell whistling her children to dinner. Though he had heard the whistle many times, he had not answered it since his first day in town. Now he felt, as he had that day, that it was meant for him. But this time, of course, there was a difference. He was no stranger. He was Maniac McGee, the kid who had walked barefoot through the dump near their house. The Pickwell kids cheered when he showed up and treated him like a legend in the, in the flesh. Mrs. Pickwell did better. She treated him like a member of the family, as if she would have been surprised if he hadn't come on the whistle. Nor was Maniac the only visitor for dinner. Mr. Pickwell had brought home a down-and-out shoe salesman in sore need of sympathy and a good meal. As Maniac ate and talked and laughed his way through dinner, he couldn't help thinking of the Beals, how alike the two families were, friendly, giving, accepting. So easily he could picture the Beals' brown faces around the dinner table and the little Pickwell kids' white bodies in the bathtub at 728 Sycamore. Whoever, made, whoever had made of Hector Street a, a barrier, it, it was surely not these people. Fortified by his good time at the Pickwells, Maniac returned to the McNabs. After the East End scare, Russell and Piper no longer demanded stunts of him in return for attending school. On the one hand, this was a relief to Maniac. On the other, it left him with less influence over them. He could always extort a day or two in class from them with the free weekly pizza. Beyond that, he, he goaded them toward school any way he could. He organized a marbles tournament that could take place in only, only in the schoolyard during recess. He tried reading to them, as he had to Hector and Lester, and to Grayson, but they paid as much attention as the roaches. He took them to the library, then, then scrapped that idea after their shenanigans left the librarian blubbering and blue-faced. Then May arrived, with its warm weather, and blew away what little power he had left. The boys began again to dream of travel. Wood appeared in the backyard. They were building a raft. Gonna sail down the river to the ocean, they said. One day, he heard frenzied horn honking and screaming. He turned to see an ancient, rusty gas hog convertible rolling by with Russell behind the wheel and Piper jumping up and down and shrieking in the back seat. By the time Maniac caught up, they were gone and the car was shuddering against the telephone pole. Another time, he had to run them down and haul them back to Dorsey's grocery, where he made them empty their bulging pockets of the 50 bubble gums they had stolen. It was a maddening, chaotic time for Maniac. Writing in the morning and reading in the afternoons gave him just enough stability to ensure the zany nights at the McNabs. When he asked himself why he didn't just drop it, drop them, the answer was never clear. It wasn't so much that he wanted to stay as that he couldn't go. In some vague way, to abandon the McNabb boys would be to abandon something in himself. He couldn't shake the suspicion that deep inside Russell and Piper McNabb, in the prayer dark seed of their kidhoods, they were identical to Hester and Lester Beale. But they were spoiling, rotting from the inside out, and outside in, like a pair of peaches in the sun. Soon, unless he... Unless somebody did something, the rot would reach the pit. And yet he held back. Oh, he prodded and persuaded and inspired and bribed the boys to do right, but he never forced them, never commanded, never shouted, because to do so would be parental, and he was not yet ready for that. How could he act as a father and to these boys when he himself ate to be somebody's son? But then, one day, the boys went too far. He found them playing with the old glove Grayson had given him for Christmas. And if that weren't bad enough, they were using it as a football, punting it back and forth. Maniac exploded. He popped off for a good ten minutes, got it all out. This was the last straw, he told them. From now on, it was going to be different. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. When I say jump, he say, how high? Got it? They got it. For the first time in their lives, the boys were speechless. 
speechless as they did their homework that night, speechless as they went to bed at nine o'clock, speechless as they went off to school next morning, the peace lasted three days. Shock accounted for the first day. The second and third days were a new game called obedience or being good. When the game lost its appeal, Maniac lost his power. He told them to sit. They stood. He told them to stand. They sat. Instead of going to school, they worked on their raft. Instead of doing homework, they played war in the pillbox. They brought their plastic weapons down from the hole and stationed themselves at the two small gunnery slots in the cinder block wall and blasted away at anyone moving through the house. Not to mention imaginary rebels streaming through the door and over the windows. Windows. Windowsills. Stop! Maniac finally yelled and snatched the two red gun barrels protruding from the slots. In a moment, two more barrels appeared. Stop! He commanded. Ain't shooting you, Russell whined. We're shooting them rebels. Bam, bam, bam. Pow. Got one. Pow. Bam. Got another. Bam, bam. I said stop. Maniac grabbed the guns, threw them on the floor, and stomped on them. He didn't stop until they were plastic splinters. The only sound was that of the turtle scratching somewhere in the room. The gunnery slots framed the boys' dumbstruck faces. Russell was the first to speak. Get out of my house. Yeah, sneered Piper. Out of here. Maniac went upstairs, gun essential, and was gone. That night and the next night he slept at the park. The following day, as he sat reading in the library, in came the McNabb boys. They rushed to him. Hey, maniac, blurted Piper. We've been looking all over for you. You gotta come to my birthday party. I'm having a party tomorrow. What do you say, huh? You coming, huh? Maniac couldn't believe it. The ugly feelings of the other day showed nowhere on their excited faces. Come on, maniac, you gotta. And just like that, as he stared at them, the idea came, an idea as zany as they were. The words seemed too to lift right off their faces, like sunburnt skin peeling. Well, okay, he said, on one condition. What's that? If I can bring somebody with me. Sure, bring everybody. We're going to party. The librarian edged closer to the phone. The McNabb boys didn't know whom they did expect Maniac to bring to the party, but one thing for sure, they did not expect him to come walking through the front door with a black kid. And that was only half of it. From the way the kid swaggered in, from the candy bar that jutted like a chocolate stogie from the corner of his mouth, from the ripped stone evil scowl on his face, the kid had to be none other than Mars Bar Thompson himself. If black meant bad, if black meant in your face nastiness, if black meant as far from white as you could get, then Mars Bar Thompson was the blackest of the black. Here, in the middle of their living room, stopping the party, the neighborhood kids, the Cobras, even George McNabb, stopping them dead as traffic, just walk in through the front door, the, the steel door, breeze right on in, past the bar, standing there, I own this jointing there, before they knew what was happening, before anyone could reach for anything which, of course, is just what Maniac had had in mind. Remembering how little Grayson had known about black people and black homes? Thinking of the McNabs' wrong-headed notions. Thinking of Mars Bars' knee-jerk reaction to anyone wearing a white skin. And thinking, actually, what else could you expect? Whites never go inside black homes, much less inside their thoughts and feelings. And blacks are just as ignorant of whites. What white kid could hate blacks after spending five minutes in the Beals' house? And what black kid could hate whites after answering Mrs. Pickwell's dinner whistle? But the East Enders stayed in the East, and the West Enders stayed in the West, and the less they knew about each other, the more they invented. It hadn't been easy, finding Mars Bar, taking all his lip about cheating on the race, taking some bumps, some shoves, Mars goading him to fight. But keeping his own cool, matching Mars Bars' glare for glare, telling him that he wasn't as bad as he thought he was, really stoking him now, making him slam his candy bar to the ground. No, you want to tell me why I ain't so bad, fish? Go ahead, for I waste you, chest to chest. 
keeping cool, letting Mars do all the huffing. Simple. You don't cross Hector. You stay over here where it's safe. How bad could you be over there? Stepping back then, folding his arms, smugging it up just enough, standing there in the white skin, gazing nonchalantly about six blocks deep in the heart of the black side. Guess that makes me badder than you. They did not go straight to the McNabs. First, they went to the Pickwells. Maniac wanted Mars Bar to see the best the West End had to offer. The little Pickwells made as much fuss over Mars Bar as over Maniac. They believed, as did all little kids in the West End, that he carried a hundred Mars Bars with him at all times. Not surprisingly, Mrs. Pickwell never batted an eye when she saw who was coming to dinner. It was quite a sight, all right. Sixteen Pickwells plus Maniac, plus a down-and-out golf caddy, 18 so-called white faces, and Mars Bar Thompson. To his credit, Mars Bar didn't use the words fish belly or honky once, though on one occasion he did bend the truth a might. When a Pickwell kid asked him if it was true about the famous race in April, the maniac really beat him going backwards, Mars Bar studied his fork for a minute and said, yeah, he went backwards, but you got the story wrong. Wasn't me he beat, was my brother Milky Way. The little kids couldn't understand why the grown-ups laughed for five minutes after that. As for Mars Bar himself, his experience never expression never changed until the dinner was almost over. When the littlest non-baby Pickwell, Dolly, called him Mr. Bar, and even then it wasn't so much a smile as a crack in the glare. Even if Mars wasn't letting on, Maniac could tell that he was pleased to learn his fame had spread to the West. When they left, half the Pickwell kids followed them, begging Mars to perform his legendary feat of stopping traffic. Don't, Maniac warned. It might not work over here. But the Pickwells persisted, and when they searched Marshall Street, Mars Bar commanded, Stay here! and stepped into the traffic. Not only did the shamble jive shuck and hip Hip doodle, at his own sweet pace, he did something he had never done in the East End. He came to a complete and utter halt halfway across the street and let nothing but the evil in his eyes take care of the rest. He stood like that for one full minute. By the time he finally moved on to the other side, so the legend goes, 23 cars, several bicycles, and a bus were stacked in a dead stop in both directions. Maniac hurried across while the Pickwell stood at the curb, cheering and waving goodbye. But no one was cheering now in Fort McNabb, and Maniac knew that, despite the swagger in the scow and the chocolate stogie, Mars Bar Thompson was one uneasy dude.